Good afternoon. My name is Jason Ponton. I'm the editor-in-chief and the publisher of MIT Technology Review, which is MIT's 115-year-old magazine dedicated to science and technology. Welcome to Old South, which I would call the Vatican of the Congregationalist movement. If the Congregational movement wasn't so adamantly opposed to Episcopalianism, of any sort. You are attending the digital by design uh, discussion. I have three wonderful authors with me. To my immediate right, Vikram Chandra, the author of Geek Sublime, which the New York Times in a rather backhanded compliment called an unexpected <laughs> tour de force. Uh, <laughs> that sounds bad, doesn't it? Um, Vikram is a fiction writer who stumbled into uh, nonfiction. Seated right next to him, I have Howard Gardner, who is the Hobbes Professor of Cognition and Education at Harvard's Graduate School of Education and the author of The App Generation. And farthest from me is Judith Do Donath, am I pronouncing Donath, correctly? Yes. Donath, the author of The Social Machine and a fellow at the Berkman Center up at Harvard and the founder of the Sociable Machines Group at my own University of MIT. We're going to have a chat, and um, I'm going to invite the audience to participate as soon as I can. But we're going to begin by short presentations by each of the authors. After that, I'll ask a few questions, uh, and then it's your turn. So we're going to begin with Judith, please. Hello. So um, what I wanted to do is start by showing you some rather beautiful organisms. Uh, they look like something you might see in a Caribbean sea, but they're actually visualizations, computer renderings of data. The artist, Alex Dragulescu, based them on f different features of spam. So the, the, how long the spam is, the words it use, uses, whether it says pharmacy or enlargement, for instance, to determine their colors and how they grow. In the, um, in the online world where everything that you see is virtual, synthesized, the relationship between beauty and goodness, form and meaning, can be rather arbitrary. So I like watching people. I've always been an observer. I like going to cafes and watching people walk by. And we all do this. It's how we make sense of the world. We extrapolate from what we see of someone, the clothes they wear, the way they walk, what they're like. And it's one of the things that attracts us to be out in public, to see and be seen. But online, it should be even more exciting. There's millions, now actually billions of people online. And they're talking, they're arguing, they're playing games, they're lending sympathy and support to each other. And it's an extraordinary and unprecedented social space, and it's much more open than the, you know, the physical space. Even here in a place like the Boston Book Festival, you can't just go up to a totally random stranger and start speaking to them the way that you can online. But um, it's also the inverse of the physical world, where here there's so much to see every time you look at a person. There, there's no body, there's nothing to observe, there's no facial expressions, there's no clothes, there's no gestures. And the social cues that are so plentiful to see face to face are missing. In 1991, I spent a summer living in Japan, and I, was, I really enjoyed it. It was fascinating, but I was also really, really lonely. I was a graduate student at MIT at the time, and so what I would do is I would log into our main computer, and I'd run the who command, which would show you just a list of who was online. It was sort of like this little window for me to see what my friends were doing, which because of the time difference, mostly they were sleeping. But you know, I just like get to see, you know, I get to see at the end of my day the start of their day and everyone arriving, and I came back and what I really wanted was to say how could I make that into a real window where I could actually see what people were doing online, and so when I came back I decided to try and make that window, and I um, this is in the 90s made a program that I called Visual Who that would let me see, you know, let me have this window onto a community. And the first problem I realized was visualizing a social space. So you see with the spam plants, how arbitrary these things could be, would be to say, where is everybody? If you're going to put something on a screen, people have to be, be somewhere. If I put them all in alphabetical order, it would look kind of like a memorial. That wasn't really the effect that I wanted. So I started by using a, our email system to figure out 
who is on mailing lists together and use that as a way of putting people near the others who had similar interests. And then I could use that, once I had a layout, um, to say, filter it through and show only who's online now, who's active. This is, you know, the view you see now is what it looked like at four in the morning. And then this would be at one in the afternoon, then it was lively. So this was sort of a beginning. It's, you know, it's just names. It's, it's nothing like looking at people's faces. But it was a beginning of thinking about how we could make this world of all these people be something um, much more visual and sensory. And so when I was at MIT with my students, we did all different kinds of experiments with this. Um, this one is a picture. This is a portrait of um, two people's email correspondence. And it shows over time what are the things that they talked about. Um, and it could be beautiful or beastly. This, this actually happens to be a record of my email with my ex-husband. So it started out <laughs> kind of beautiful. It turns into something a little beastly. but. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that was interesting when we showed this, um, when we gave this to people to try and use, um, you can see it a little closer up. It just it shows the words. It shows how what are the words that are used with greatest frequency at different times. What was interesting to us was we thought people would use it as a mirror to see the things in their own life, to have a better sense of how they'd corresponded with people. But people were printing these out and putting them up on their cubicles. And we asked them, you know, OK, what do you, you know, they said, it didn't seem too private. It's just words. You get a sense of the relationship, but you're not revealing anything. But that also that it was a, like taking a snapshot of a virtual relationship, which is something, even though we have so much of our lives are online, you don't have that equivalent of, you know, you and your friend on a hike or you and your friend at a party. And it's a way of creating that snapshot. This is another example of, um, this is a piece that was visualizing people on Twitter. You know, today, Twitter is where people get news, you get gossip, you get jokes, and you follow different people. But often it's hard in that stream of words to get a sense of who's who. And the idea here was to say, for each person, one side of the head shows the words they've used that you're following. One side is the words they've typically used over time. And the other side are the words they're using right now. So in a way, this is another take on that window. You know, I can imagine wanting to come into an office or even home even and have this as sort of, it, this is just a snapshot, but the, it would update live with the words that are changing. To have it as sort of this window that I could look into this world of people who I care about, I want to know what they're talking about. So these were all, we did tons of these experiments of how to make this world more visual and interesting and to start feeling like you could actually um, do people watching online. But as, you know, I started this in the 90s and as time went by, one of the things we came to realize about the online world is that it wasn't necessarily all sort of people happily chatting in cafes, that a tremendous amount of what goes on <coughs> online is kind of vicious arguing, harassment, um, you know, some of it, some of it started, you know, some of the trolling started in the early days of, of Usenet before <coughs> even the web. Um, the first one I remember seeing were people, um, there was a very nice news group for people who loved cats. And it was called rec.pets.cats. And another news group that was um, probably made up of like adolescent boys decided to invade it. So what they did was they would come in and pretend to be cat lovers and they would like write increasingly disturbing things about, you know, <laughs> is it okay if, if, you know, if my cat is on the counter? I was thinking of spraying bleach at her to get her off. <laughs> and people would be really horrified. Anyway, it completely ended the use of that as a conversational space because it all got taken up with like trying to get these, trying to like teach these people not to spray bleach while they're off laughing in their own news group, but how they had harassed these people who somewhat may have asked for it because they tended to speak in a mix of meows and baby talk. So, but some of these examples today we have, this week is, is Gamer, Gamergate. There's, you know, there's a constant stream of stories of harassment. Some are a little bit funny, some are really horrible. The stories of people who um, you know, follow up on families who've like lost a child and harass them. So there's a really, there's a huge problem of bad behavior online because in a world where there's no body, um, where there's no body, where there's very little history to be seen, it's very, very easy 
to come in and behave really badly. So the real challenge here is finding ways to make interfaces that also help people behave in a more pro-social way. 